watching Shalom TV, celebrating Jewish culture. Funding for Shalom TV has been provided by the following. And by viewers like you. I just want to start by how I think where Abbas was at uh, before the president's speech and how does the president's speech challenge him. Um, look, in terms of where he's been the last few months, I've had four meetings with him, uh, two of them alone, a third I brought a, a group with him uh, in the last uh, nine months or so. And um, he clearly has been, believes that diplomats, and he, you know, he doesn't say which ones, he said all of them. <laughs> Uh, said that it's a waste of his time, uh, or I, mean, I said virtually all, I should be precise, it's a waste of his time to negotiate peace with Israel because nothing's going to happen with this government. I said, I think that's very unfortunate that, that you've been led into this direction. Uh, he said, so we, we've got to think of other ways. And I think it, he's in the legacy mode. Uh, he has announced a hundred times he wants to quit, and he doesn't want to run again. I think he sees that for him, the two main issues uh, and legacy are to be called the unifier of his people and someone who could win international recognition for his people at the UN. And I think that has led him down this course. I think it's unfortunate um, in many ways. I was uh, just in Israel for these last few days, just got back on Friday, and I met with someone who's very much at the pinnacle of the Israeli defense establishment, and I, and I spent over two hours with him the other night, and I said, tell me, do you believe there's actually going to be a Palestinian unity government? He said, no, I don't believe it, because the differences are just too wide between them. I don't see them rushing to do this. I see this more as an, a joint election committee to have an election. Now, that could be too optimistic of an assessment. Um, he said, I don't see them integrating the security services uh, at all, and, uh, but we will have to see um, how that turns out. I think Abbas has tried to convey to the White House that it will take months before this unity government even comes together, if at all. But um, we shall see. I think it was, it was a mistake. And while a lot of people in this room have probably analyzed the President's speech on Thursday and maybe the President's speech this morning, what it means for U.S.-Israel relations, um, I think if you're a Palestinian looking at the speech, uh, this does not look so great to you. And I know that's hard for people in this room to understand because they're looking at it through the prism of U.S.-Israel relations. But if you're uh, a Palestinian looking at the speech, what you see is much more commonality with Israel than you see differences. And I just would like to put it in, in that case, um, where those differences are vis-a-vis -vis the U.S.-Palestinian relationship and why, if you're a Palestinian looking at it, you see the U.S. and the Israelis pretty close together. First, the president was very clear and he slammed the Palestinian initiative to unilaterally establish a state or to go to the UN and delegitimize Israel. I think he's made it virtually impossible for the Europeans to support this move at the UN. If you ask me the timing of the president's speech, it was that was the issue, was that you have the G8 coming up next week. The Europeans are saying you can't beat something with nothing. Uh, I don't see an American plan. I see a vacuum for the last two years. And uh, if we don't see something, we're going to the UN. Uh, I think there's a clear understanding with leading Europeans that uh, if the US does come forward with something, that they will not go to the UN. Of course, we will you know, test this in the, in the coming months. Um, it is interesting that Ehud Barak, in, in talking about the speech, who's also a defense minister and confident of Netanyahu, said this, um, the, 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 the differences between us and the Americans are narrow. But for the Palestinians, um, this was shutting a door very hard on the whole September approach. Uh, a fellow who's been a withering critic of the Israeli government in Israel, a fellow named Gidon Levy, said tonight is the night, he was talking about Thursday night, um, that the September died, that the whole idea of the UN initiative was over. 
uh, because by losing the president, uh, they've clearly lost the Europeans. The quartet has now endorsed the president's speech. So if you're a Palestinian, you've just, you've just seen the American president shut the door on you. Uh, and I can bring you the textual uh, proofs if anyone wants to ask me that. The second thing is the other element of the unity approach was to have some understanding that you're threading the needle with Hamas, that you could be both in a unity government but not having Hamas in the government. And um, to me, that was, um, uh, you know, he said none of the ministers would be Hamas. They, they wouldn't be Fatah. They would be technocrats. Their only job is to organize the election for a year from now. Uh, and yet the president made clear that the United States, and he made clear this morning that the U.S. will judge this new government by three yardsticks, whether it accepts Israel's uh, right to exist, whether it disavows violence and accepts previous conditions. Those are all the three uh, criteria of the quartet of 2006. So that is not also, if you're a Palestinian, um, now the bar is suddenly a lot higher for you to climb because the president just made clear uh, this is the yardsticks that the U.S. is going to look at the unity government. A third thing, I think it's pretty clear, is that the Palestinians will not get the territory uh, in the West Bank unless they give the quid for the quo. And that is very explicit recognition of Israel, as the president called it, a Jewish state, the nation state of the Jewish people. Now, this could be mutual recognition. Uh, I've discussed this with him privately. I said, I don't see you getting the, the land you want unless Israel gets what it wants. And I think the president repeated it over and over again that there's a, uh, it's a clear quid pro quo. The fourth point is not solving this problem all at once. Some of you have come to these sessions for the last few years. Uh, the one at the session I did last year where I showed you the maps, and I always tend to use this analogy, so I, I'm afraid to repeat it. I use the football analogy is that if we throw a Hail Mary, that's a desperate pass in football, all the way to the end zone, it never works. Uh, it's always either an incomplete pass or an interception. And I've said, better to throw a screen pass, that's a short pass in football, and run the ball 70 yards. And if we, in the Middle East, whenever it's all or nothing, it's nothing. I think those are the exact words. And the president has crafted this initiative along these ideas of borders and security and recognition, believing you can't solve these core issues of self-definition, uh, the, the two narrative issues of this conflict, are Jerusalem and the refugees. And if you try to take it all on at once, you are guaranteed to fail. And that has been, I think, a key approach of gradualism that is not always what the Palestinians want to hear because they think it's a ticket to nowhere. For them, it, it, it pushes off some of their core demands. But frankly, and these are the issues of self-definition of the parties. Uh, it cuts to uh, these issues of self-definition. What I mean is religion and nationalism. And unless the leaders condition the societal landscape, you know, which they haven't done, you're not going to be able to solve this. So if you try to do all or nothing, it's nothing. So when the president says, we're not going to deal with Jerusalem now, um, that is a big deal. And that's why the Palestinians are not running to embrace the speech. Uh, and they see that position as closer to the Israeli position. Now. I'm not saying the Israelis like borders and security. They would clearly like to, to take refugees off the table. But in their view, um, that the refugee issue is not being discussed now, Jerusalem is not being discussed now, is not something they liked. I had huge debates on television other places for the last couple of years with Arabs who always say, well, you can't even conceive of an American initiative without Jerusalem. Uh, it won't work. And I, I, and I said what I said. The next point is that this is not a return to the pre-67 lines. Uh, the president really, uh, in, the, in his remarks this morning, he said what I think he should have said Thursday night, is clarify, what does swaps mean? For those of us who live in this world, uh, you know, there's a few of us who live in that world, we live in that world of shorthand. But most people don't live in that world of shorthand. They don't know it. And I think it's unfortunate for people who have mischaracterized this president as if to say he wants Israel to return to the status quo ante before 1967. Even though Abbas, to be fair, has said, we know it's not going back to what it was before 67. Uh, there's going to be swaps, and Israel's gonna ha we're going to have to accept settlement blocks. Now, the issue is how many settlement blocks? And that will be the negotiations. Yes, Ariel, not Ariel. They can discuss it. But uh, the concept on this one for the Palestinians is not hard for them to swallow uh, because they have, they have actually accepted this concept before. And to be fair, Netanyahu 
um, in his Knesset speech, although he doesn't get much credit in the media, um, said that Israel will be only, the consensus issue in Israel is settlement blocks. And he said at the end, I will be guided by these sets of consensus. Anyway, as someone who's worked on maps for, for a long, long time, I could say that any way you slice and dice a, a settlement blocks, that is about 10% of the West Bank. So if Netanyahu was saying at the end of the day, there'll be 90% of the West Bank, um, because anything on the Jordan River, he said, is a military presence, not sovereignty. It was a clear uh, inference. Uh, the differences here are over 10% of the West Bank. That's it. Um, so, but that on the blocks, I think there's more of a consensus than the other. On the issue of security, I think, um, again, maybe not everyone is going to be happy on all sides, but I think he did, the president came closer to the Israeli position than the Palestinian position. He said it would, anything on security arrangements would have to be agreed upon and that there would be, it would have to be performance-based, meaning that um, the effectiveness of security arrangements must be demonstrated. In other words, there's not going to be like artificial deadlines in three years Israel is out. There has to be performance-based approach. He talked about it being non-militarized or demilitarized. Uh, Abbas has used these terms too. That is actually not hard for him to accept. But the part about that the transitional arrangements well, has to be agreed upon and that, um, that there's got to be performance-based approach is not something he's going to love to hear. Uh, he made clear no substitute for negotiations and a return to the table. You cannot impose peace. Well, that's not always been the European position or the Arab position exactly since the Palestinians haven't really negotiated much in the last two years. Um, so that's not going to be easy for them to swallow. Uh, make sure the Arab Spring does not spill into a Palestinian autumn. When the president spoke about populism and how it's going to be harder if you don't try to solve this problem now, uh, Israel has wanted to have as much distance as possible from the Arab Spring. Uh, it clearly does, does not want what it saw last Sunday where people start coming to the borders uh, and uh, this could be the future if this issue, you know, leaves the hand of negotiators. And we'll pine for the days where there were people like uh, George Mitchell, Dennis Ross, Hillary Clinton, were, were actually uh, helping drive this process. So I think here, too, that there is more convergence between the Israeli position and the, um, and the American position. Um, on the last point, end of conflict, end of claims, which the president said this morning, is something that, you know, that Abbas has said. He said it on, on record in Brookings. That I do think he could, uh, is fine with him. But there are differences here. And while it's natural that people here who, who don't always follow the nuances of this debate are going to take things out of context, um, the facts are that um, the differences, I think, after the Obama speech is a higher road uh, for the Palestinians to navigate than it is for Israel to navigate at this time. So I've, I've got a, uh, more things I'd like to say, but I'm afraid to go over my time limit. But I, I just think, um, I think that it's important to maintain some sort of balance in, in what was heard here and how it's going to be interpreted. But the most important audience for this president, in my view, was, was not the American Jewish community, was not the Arabs even, but it was the Europeans. He's trying to say, back off this internationalization of the conflict where you try to solve this conflict in courtrooms of the International Criminal Court and all these other forums, uh, which Abbas alluded to in this op-ed, although it's unclear if he wrote it or read it is another issue. But, um, but the point is, the point is, is that the key thing is the president is going to this G8 summit. He needs Europe on America's side. The Europeans say, you want to beat something? You can't beat something with nothing. Give us something that we know that this process is real. After 40 years, just say, come to the table and let's talk, is not going to cut it. Uh, and that time is not on the side of moderates. So I think that there was a real effort to keep Europe squarely on America's side. Now, if Zimbabwe and Cuba and some of the other countries want to vote for this thing in September, let them vote for it. But I don't think it's going to be decisive. Europe is the key battlefield. That's why Netanyahu has gone to Europe. That's why Abbas has gone to Europe. And I think the president wanted to lay down the markers to the Europeans and basically tell the Palestinians, now the ball is in your court. Uh, you've you've got to, this is, this is where America stands. Now let's see what you do. And this will be interesting to see how he deals with Hamas, the unity government. Does he endorse the quartet principles? He has endorsed the quartet principles many times. But does, does, does this silent partner to this government uh, embrace it? 
And again, this is a government which may never be formed because of the differences between the parties. So we'll have to see. But I think that if you're a Palestinian looking at, at the speech, you now see it's a much steeper climb that you have than you had uh, before the speech. So thank you all for listening. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Look, it is apparent, it is obvious that in September of this year, presuming that Egypt holds parliamentary elections, those elections will result in a radical and probably Islamist majority in parliament. And I'm not, you don't have to believe me. Uh, Amr Musa, who is perhaps the next president, said it. So we're going to have an Egypt which is a radical state which sees itself aligned with Hamas. That's a rather important factor to take into consideration here. Uh, and there are, we, we will probably see in practice the abrogation of the Egypt-Israel peace treaty, not, not in theory, not announced, but it will happen. And that's also sort of important to understand um, that Israel is uh, being asked to make concessions and take risks at a time when it may well face the worst security situation it's faced since the 1970s in which a treaty was, is torn up. These are factors. But let me turn, I want to talk about two things. First of all, I want to talk about Palestinian politics and I want to talk about Palestinian strategy. Regarding Palestinian politics, there are three uh, points I want to make. First of all, the society and the general atmosphere. It's clear that in the, um, what now, uh, let's say 19 years, 18 or 19 years since the negotiations in Oslo and the signing of the Israel PLO agreement, 19 years, that means someone who was born in that year, 1974, the, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 94, the establishment of the PA, 17 years ago, someone who was born on the day that that agreement was signed would be getting ready to go to college now. Um, so these aren't recent events that almost no effort has been made by the Palestinian Authority to change Palestinian society thinking and debate, whether it be the schools, whether it be the mosques, whether it be the statements of officials, whether it be who they name soccer tournaments after. Uh, there's been no real preparation or discussion, and as a result, public opinion is problematic. And this creates great difficulties. Because if you say that suppose the government, uh, the PA, wanted to make a deal with Israel with territorial swaps and strong security guarantees and end of conflict and recognition of uh, Israel as a Jewish state, remember that the opening line of the Palestinian constitution is Palestine is an Arab state and its official religion is Islam with respect for other religions. They can't do it because the public opinion has not been prepared. In fact, it's been prepared to call them traitors and to see them as horrible people whose fate may well deserve death. That's a huge problem. And it cannot be forgotten. The second issue is Fatah internal politics. When the Fatah Congress was held, we were told in the mass media that all of these young, moderate people were elected to the Central Committee. Unfortunately, if you take the list of people and look at them, taking into account the people who were elected and also the people who got the most votes. And if you're interested in, in my past columns, I've done very detailed analyses of this. These are not flexible, moderate, and even in most cases, young people. They basically constitute two groups. Uh, one group are old Arafat people, uh, and the other group are hardliners in, the con in that context. Um, this is not, uh, uh, now, these are people who don't necessarily want, well, well mo most of them don't want war and revolution and violence, but they're not people, uh, they're people who are definitely more hardline than Fayyad, definitely more hardline than Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, I think, I count, I think if there are 22 people, I count like three people I consider moderate. So that's a problem, because if that's the Fatah leadership, and that's going to determine who the next leader will be. And then the Hamas deal. Um, we have to ask ourselves the question, um, I believe the deal was mainly to, to, to look good to going to the UN, but uh, we have to ask ourselves the question, how well is Fatah able to compete with Hamas? Now certainly a lot of people in the Gaza Strip are fed up, certainly a lot of people voted for Hamas because of Fatah corruption, but it's still Fatah. The Hamas did a lot better because Fatah candidates ran against each other. Nevertheless, 
I would suggest that we should not assume, which is what a Westerner would assume, that Fatah has the advantage because Hamas is disciplined, it has an ideology, it's considered to be purer uh, in, 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 on several levels. Um, they can play the Islam card. I mean, they have real advantages. And let's look at what's happened in Europe and North America. Literally everywhere, Islamists uh, and pro-Hamas people have uh, defeated uh, Fatah people in terms of support and organization. So I'm not at all sure that in a straight up battle um, that, uh, that Fatah would win. And in addition to that, I think that Hamas is more able to draw people from Fatah, as we've seen, than Fatah is from Hamas. So there are three indicators which all point to a relatively hard line and inability and unwillingness to make peace, whatever Fayyad wants. We know that Fayyad is only there because of the donors. They would have gotten rid of him by now otherwise. We know that I think it's more likely that the successor to Abbas will be a harder line person than Abbas. Does that mean that a great opportunity has been missed? Not at all, because it's merely the people who had the power all along are substituting someone they like better. If I had time, I'd talk more about that. So this is not good news. This leads to my second point, which is about strategy. My, unfortunately, my honest conclusion, not my preference, not what I want to say, not what I feel politically, but as an honest analyst, I will say this. I don't think there's any possibility of an Israel-Palestinian agreement for years, even possibly decades. Um, I don't think that the PA is really willing to negotiate. Um, I think that the PA as a whole, not Abbas and not Fayyad, but the mechanism as a whole, is only willing to make concessions if those concessions still leave the door open to getting everything someday. That doesn't mean everybody's a hardliner, but it means the people who aren't can't, I don't think are gonna win those battles. I mean, you think that a Palestinian Authority government is gonna say, oh, by the way, we gave up the right of return. You're not going back. We've been telling you every day you are, but now you're not. And public opinion is going to accept that, and their rivals are not going to use that against them, and people aren't going to try to shoot them. It's very, very, and one of my Palestinian friends did get shot because he was uh, too moderate and was very severely injured. I mean, so this is the reality. Now, going to the UN with a unilateral declaration is the ideal strategy for the PA because they don't have to negotiate with Israel. So they can get it. Theoretically, they can get everything they want without giving anything. Now, is it going to work totally? No, it isn't. But it is the perfect strategy for the current PA to engage in. And they figure they'll make a big step forward and they'll get a lot more support. And if they keep pushing over the years, eventually uh, they'll get it. Now, one can say that these governments appear to be close to a deal, that they're only separated by a small margin, we're almost there, but it's not true. It's not true. And that's why if we spoke here five years from now or 10 years from now, I don't think we're gonna see uh, the conflict resolved. I wish it were otherwise. Finally, I think it's very important to talk about a set of issues that's literally never addressed and has to be addressed first and foremost, perfect, in any discussion on this issue. And I call these the day after issues. In other words, let's assume, and this is what people in research centers and, and, and uh, analysts are supposed to do, let's assume that there's a peace agreement. Let's assume that there's a two-state solution the Palestinian Authority becomes the government of Palestine. Borders are agreed on in some way. For the purposes of this analysis, it really doesn't matter too much precisely where they are. It doesn't matter precisely what happens to Jerusalem. But what are the kinds of problems and issues that we know for sure would come up? Because we should talk about these and analyze these. And what are some of these issues? Well, one issue is, what would the state of Palestine situation be regionally? Assuming that Iran, and, Ham, uh, and I'll leave Hamas aside for just one second, Iran and Hezbollah and Syria uh, and other, and the Muslim Brotherhood and maybe even the Egyptian government are all interested in power over the state of Palestine and 
tend to support Hamas. Um, that's going to lead to serious problems of the stability of a Palestine state, the subversion that it would face from some of these countries. And that leads to the second issue, the possibility of Hamas taking over, perhaps with elements of Fatah. If they took over and they abrogated the agreement, this is a real problem. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing one can do about this, but we should be talking about, okay, what could we do uh, about this? But there's a very real possibility that uh, Israel agrees, Palestinian state's established, and it's taken over by Hamas, and it's a, it becomes a revolutionary Islamist state. Third, I'm willing to bet, I don't, I don't like to bet, gamble, but I bet money that within a month, of the, of the establishment of the two-state solution, cross-border attacks start against Israel from the state of Palestine. Now, what is the government of Palestine going to do? We would like to imagine it would say, this is absolutely unacceptable. They round up the people, and they throw them into prison for long periods of time. But I don't assume that, especially given their past behavior, especially given the fact that Palestine public opinion is probably going to favor uh, these attacks. They're going to be popular, and repressing them is going to be unpopular. So what if the government doesn't stop the attacks? We can't do it. We really tried to find them. We can't do it. We can't find them. What if there's collaboration by the security forces with these attacks? And Israel is facing cross-border attacks on a weekly or every other week basis. And then Israel wants their forces. You're not dealing with it. We want to go in and deal with it. And they say, well, we're a member of the UN. We're an independent state. Article 51, it's aggression. And are people going to say, well, wait a minute. You didn't control your border. No, they're going to say Israel is at fault. That has to be taken into account. It has to be taken into account the, the concept of two stages um, in which Palestine, the state of Palestine is established and used as a base for trying to get everything, trying to destroy Israel. And there will be grievances. The right of return will be a grievance. We didn't get that. If there is a 5% or 6% or 8% even territorial swap. That will be, look at Lebanon. Oh, well, you didn't pull out of the Shaba farms, so that means we can wage war on you. These are, are real problems. And I don't like the fact that people are blithely talking about very all these wonderful peace plans, the word security guarantees, quote unquote. Well, we had security guarantees from the UN over Lebanon in 2006. So these are real issues that have to be taken into account. Now, I want there to be peace. I want there to be a two-state solution. I want there to be a state of Palestine where people live happily and develop their culture and economy. But remember that everything Fayyad has done, all the prosperity built up, could disappear within 24 hours if certain people decide that they want to have a third intifada. And we've seen this happen in a sense before. Therefore, what I want to say to you is that if we analyze Palestinian politics in detail, what we find is that what we're generally told by politicians in the mass media, that there's this great peace process, that we're really close, that everybody wants to negotiate, matches Western thinking about the issue, but does not match the situation that exists on the ground. Notice that. Have you ever seen anybody take the Fatah Central Committee and go through the people one by one and talk about their different viewpoints. Who got the most votes of anybody? Someone who opposed the Oslo Agreement in 1993 and refused to return and is very close to the Syrians. He came in first. Who came in 23rd and at first looked like he won, he got into the committee by one vote and they said, no, we miscounted, you're out. A guy who was a genuine moderate in the Palestinian uh, framework. These are difficult problems and we cannot pretend that they don't exist. And the fact that a lot of the mass media, a lot of go Western governments and others pretend they don't exist worries me. And that also does relate to President Obama's speech, which did not take any of those factors uh, into account at all. And again, uh, that's not my topic, but I, I will definitely be happy to say some things that haven't been said yet about that. Thank you for your time and attention. Well, I have a great pleasure now of standing with one of my favorite people and one of the true great analysts right now in the Jewish world, David Makovsky. First of all, you are brilliant, and I thank, thank you, you for uh, 
you know, letting us tape this for you. When I listened to you and Barry Rubin, mm -hmm. there was, although there were many ways in which you agreed, there seemed to be a difference in tone of optimism. Sure. Am I right? Yes. If you were, if you know, if he was here right now, yeah. and and we said to him, why are you so negative in your outlook? David has a more positive outlook. What would you want to say to him that you think he misunderstands? Look, I think what he is missing, in my view, and I have a lot of respect for Barry. He's a big scholar, and um, you know our differences on the panel should not mask my respect for him. I want to say that um, I, have, I have enormous respect for him. Where I think he's missing is nobody knows for sure that um, that the, the, the you know we all believe there's no grand deal tomorrow morning. The question is, are you better off trying to do what you can do and deferring what you can't do uh, amid a belief, which I have, that time is not on the side of moderates, given dem demographics in the region, given um, the role of new Arab populist governments, and given you know, a clear sense of the role of of rejectionists that are out there and that if you do nothing you discredit the people who actually want to do a deal with you and you embolden those who believe that uh, the moderates were just Zionists kissing uh, Israelis and uh, achieve nothing. We have a stake in that and how that uh, dynamic is on the Arab side and to assure that we don't try is to, is to give a gift to the rejectionist. And we have a clear interest in not giving a gift to the rejectionist and not in enhancing Israel's delegitimization on the world arena. And so I would say if you do nothing for the next five or 10 years, you, you, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in guaranteeing all the negative uh, trends that um, Israel wants to avoid. Do you worry for the future? So time is a huge factor. Okay. Do you worry for the state of Israel? Of course, people have always worried for the state of Israel, but uh, you know, I'm an optimist on a, on a basic level. I believe that Israel is very resilient. It has fought wars before. It's a thriving democracy. And ultimately, Israel's willingness to live is greater than its enemy's willingness to die. I love talking to you. I wish you all the best. We'll, we'll follow you again. Thank, well, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for your time. David Makovsky, thank you. Thank you.